And if you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be picking up the end of Matthew chapter 3. As you're turning there, you may have noticed this past week that Iran was in the news. Iran, if you're unaware, is a country in the Middle East. And uh, so anytime you talk about the Middle East, there's usually conflict associated with it, things like that. But some of the news that you might have missed with Iran, the church, the underground church is growing. Despite what's going on in the world, at any moment, in any time, the gospel can penetrate. And the gospel can change lives. And so that's what we're seeing in Iran. We're seeing churches started. We're seeing people saved. Um, But again, in Iran, it's all underground. We call it the underground church, which means they're meeting in secret and in hiding, maybe in caves or in basements or wherever they get the opportunity. But there's a movement growing in Iran. And at the heart of it is the gospel. I don't know what that does to your soul or what it does to your spirit, but what it does to me is it helps me to remember that no matter what's going on or what's happening or what turmoil may happen in the world, and if we break out in World War III or whatever, the gospel can still change lives. Because the gospel ultimately cannot be stopped. It says in Scripture that in the end, in heaven, there'll be someone from every tribe and tongue and nation and people group. That means when we go to these places where there is, there, there's been no gospel proclamation, where there is no church, where there is none of that happening, guess what that means? Somebody's getting saved. Because Scripture says that there will be someone from every tribe, every tongue, every nation represented in heaven. That means the gospel can pierce any culture. It can pierce any turmoil or any conflict. And so I will encourage you this week, every time you turn on the news or every time you hear something, you hear the word Iran, pray for the church and the spread of the gospel that's happening there. So now you have time to turn to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 13 through 17 to begin with. We're going to be talking about the baptism of Jesus. So Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Jesus answered him, Allow it for now, because this is a way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you you this morning and we open up your word, we ask that you would speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. We ask that you would transform us and remake us into the image of your Son. That you'd give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. That you'd give us the strength that we need to be to be lights to the world. And we pray most of all, Lord, in all that we do and all that we say, that we bring glory to your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, when it comes to the baptism of Jesus, we see some strange things happening here. One, Jesus goes to be baptized by John. And John, first of all, stops him and says, Whoa, 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 whoa. I need to be baptized by you. And then Jesus says, well, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So John, being a reasonable man, was like, oh, that's what we needed to fulfill all righteousness. 
Let's do it. And Jesus was baptized. So the question comes, what is baptism? Why is it important? Well, first of all, baptism is a picture. All right. How many of y'all, when you were in school, much loved the picture books more than the, the novels with just all the words? Right. I remember getting about that age where the books started to transition. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where's the pictures? I mean, this is a pretty big book, and this is all words. You know, and you're like, you're going through, and you're trying to find the picture book to read and all this stuff. And so, baptism is a picture. All right? And what's it picture? Ultimately, baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. All right? Baptism, and this time, the word baptize is a Greek word to mean to immerse. So, in he went to the river, to the Jordan River. John would have took him under the water and brought him back up. And again, that pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So baptism is like a picture, just like you would say your wedding ring is. When I got married, I put a wedding ring on. That wasn't to prove that wasn't so that I am married, because if I take the wedding ring off, I'm still married. But what it does is it lets you know that I made a commitment to my wife. And lets everybody know that I am married. Baptism is a picture to all people that you believe the gospel. That you believe that Jesus came, that He was buried, and He resurrected from the dead. And that you put your faith in Him, that when you die, you too will be resurrected for eternity. So it's a picture. It's important. Jesus was baptized. Later, at the end of the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, go and make disciples and teach them and baptize them. Jesus gave us that picture. It's a way for us to proclaim to the world that we believe the gospel. So baptism is not necessary for salvation. It's not a part of your salvation in the sense that you need it to be saved. It's just the way we step out in obedience to proclaim to the world that we believe the gospel. And so Jesus, at this point, when Jesus was being baptized, what He was doing is He was saying, I am here for a purpose. I am here to die and to resurrect from the dead. See, Jesus understood why He came. We see throughout the Scriptures in the New Testament it talks about how Jesus was slain before the foundations of the world. Jesus going to the cross was not like this plan B, this backup plan that He needed. This was always the plan. God knew that we would fall into sin, and He made way for us. So Jesus being baptized at this moment is proclaiming to everyone, this is my purpose, this is why I have come. And then all the Godhead confirms it at this moment. Again, this is where you, in, the, in the Gospels, this is your first glimpse of the Trinity. This is your first glimpse as the God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see Jesus come and be baptized. When He comes up out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes down upon Him. It says, like a dove. It doesn't say a dove came down. They're like, oh, look, a dove. It represents the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit came upon Him and the only way they could describe it was like it was like a dove. It, just, it flew down upon him. And so the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus, and then the Father spoke, This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And remember, the book of Matthew was written to the Jews to prove that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And they get here at the baptism. Of Jesus, people get to hear the Father say, This is my Son. So Jesus is the Son of God. What, what Matthew is trying to, to really dig down deep into his readers here is that, look, I want you to understand Jesus is God that came and dwelt among us. That's why you call him Emmanuel, God with us. God, the Son, stepped out of heaven and came down and lived and dwelt among us. 
to die for us so that we can be forgiven of our sins. And the baptism of Jesus just again reiterates, I know what I've come to do and I will accomplish it. So Jesus is submitting to fulfilling His calling here on earth to die for the sins of His people. I want you to think about Romans 10.9 with me. Romans 10.9 says, If we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. Again, your salvation is a relationship with God. Baptism is a proclamation of that relationship to the people around you. So if you've never been baptized, but you've given your life to Christ, baptism is important. It's not necessary to get you to heaven, but it's important to proclaim to the world that you believe the gospel. Again, that's the sign that God has given us to proclaim to people. And I can't tell you the number of times over the years in ministry, whenever somebody gets baptized, the chances are that day somebody else is getting saved. More times than not. Because there's something powerful about it. It's just like the, the, the wedding, when you go to a wedding. Man, there's something about that when they, when they put those rings on the fingers, right? At that moment. And they're proclaiming to everybody that they've committed together. That's what baptism is. You proclaiming to everyone that you believe the gospel. And so we have the baptism of Jesus. This is Jesus' is kind of like, I guess, proclamation to start His ministry. At this point, Jesus is going to begin going out and performing miracles, calling His disciples, you know, raising people from the dead. He's going to be healing the sick. And He's going to be proclaiming a message. Repent and believe. But this is how Jesus begins his ministry. By proclaiming to everyone, I have come to die and to resurrect for my people. That's why in Matthew 121 it says, You shall name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So that's the baptism of Jesus. Next, I want us to think about the temptation. In chapter 4, pick up with me here in chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, it says... Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give His angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Well, Jesus said to him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and angels came and began to serve him. A couple of things I want us to take note of with the temptation of Jesus is this follows his baptism. So Jesus is baptized. He's proclaimed to the world, I know my mission. This is what I've come to do. And he follows that up with fasting. Jesus went to go fast. He was preparing for ministry. Well, how many of y'all heard that Benjamin Franklin said uh, this quote, By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. 
A lot of time that goes along with sports. And then in Proverbs 1 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. How you prepare to face life will impact how you experience life. If you don't ever prepare for anything, when it happens, it's too late. You don't have time to prepare for it. And then life gets difficult. See, too many of us just wing it. We're just out here just winging life. See, whether we acknowledge it or not, or whether we want to believe it or not, it doesn't change the reality that we are in a spiritual war. There is a war for your soul that is waging right now. Now, I know in the news this last couple weeks, they've been talking about, oh, we're going to start World War III and all those type things. And we think about war. I don't know how you envision war to be like. You know, we think of it bloody. We think of it, you know, there's fighting. There's conflict. There's all these issues. You, right now, are in a more important, desperate war than anything our troops are facing overseas right now. Because the war that's going on spiritually will impact our eternity. If we get in a war with Iran, that's temporary. But the spiritual war that's happening for your soul is eternal. And so it's important to realize that you're in this war. Yet, time and time again, we tend to ignore this fact and we just kind of casually go about living our lives as if nothing is happening, as nothing's going on. Just like right now, we have soldiers that are actually fighting in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, various countries in Africa. They're fighting in South America. We got troops that are engaged all over the world. But it has no bearing on our life right now. Because what are we going to do today? You're going to look at your watch a few times and be like, man, he's going longer than he normally does. You're going to be thinking about lunch. We're going to go home. We're going to eat lunch. Then we're going to maybe watch some football as the playoffs are on, do some things around the house. The fact that people are actually fighting and dying all across the world has no impact on our everyday life. That's kind of like what's happening with the spiritual war that's happening within us and around us. We're casually living our life as if that's a conflict that's happening overseas. It's, it's, it's like a conflict that only happens with missionaries or pastors or re, the really super spiritual people. And we don't think that spiritual warfare is impacting our everyday life at every moment. Your enemy does not sleep, does not rest, and does not stop. Well, the question would be is how seriously are we taking this spiritual war that's happening? How you can judge for yourself a little bit, okay, how serious am I about this spiritual war that's fighting for my soul? Well, two things you can look at, time and money. Where you spend your time and where you spend your money will tell you a lot about what you value in life. It will also give you a glimpse of maybe some things that might be controlling your life or might have a greater grip on you than you realize. But you look at time and money, and that kind of gives you an idea of how serious you take the spiritual war that's happening around you. How many of y'all remember in the Old Testament the Exodus? Moses goes and says, let my people go. All right, this is the interactive part of the sermon. How many of y'all remember that, right? He said, let my people go. How many of y'all watched the old Charleston Heston movie? You know, he had that voice, and let my people go, and all this good stuff. Yeah, I remember watching that as a kid. 
um, and everything. But think about this. The, the people of Israel had become slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. And for hundreds of years, they've been calling out for God to save them. God sends someone, Moses. He leads the people out of Egypt. So they are now free. Generations have been enslaved. And finally, they're free. What's the first thing they do when they get to the wilderness? Ugh, let's go back. We don't have anything to eat. They, they start complaining immediately. How many of y'all ever had kids and you bought something for your kids? Oh, they're going to love this. And they get it and they're like, oh, this is great. But then, well, but what about this? Why didn't they get this? They start complaining and you're like, whoa, 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 what? Um, Tim Hawkins is a Christian comedian and he's pretty funny. But he did this little bit about taking his kids to Six Flags. And he said, you know, I took my kids to Six Flags one time and, and on the way home I hear the... My, my daughter in the back seat crying. She's like, ooh, ooh, ooh. He's like, well, baby, what's wrong? He's like, um, my friend's parents took them to Disney World for a week. <laughs> Yuli took us to Six Flags for a day. And he's like, what, 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 what? I just spent half a grand. He's like, half a grand. And he said, you know, of course, he's a comedian. He's just like, at that point, I was like, oh, Jesus, take the will. No, no, just take the will. But we have this idea that we're not easily satisfied with things, right? We find things to complain. So you have these people in Israel, the Israelites, they've been in captivity for 400 years, and they finally get out, and they're complaining every step of the way. They complain, and they doubt God to the point where they're judged. And everyone in, is, in, in Israel at that point that was over 20 years old died in the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Until all of them died except those that were under 20 at the time of the, when they rebelled against going to the promised land. I want you to listen to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. It says, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness forty years, that He might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep His commandments or not. And He humbled you, and let you be hungry, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that He might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. What does that wilderness journey teach us and remind us of? Well, it reminds us that we really haven't changed. We're a complaining people. We're difficult to satisfy. Because we're sinners. And when hardship comes, we fail over and over again. Look at history. History is basically how we categorize and remember our failures. For the most part. Even we say inventions. Inventions like the light bulb. We have light now. You know how many times they failed before it finally worked? May we continuously fail and fall short. We don't do anything perfectly. And then Jesus comes. Just like the people of Israel were tested, Jesus went to the wilderness and He was tested. Just like they were hungry in the wilderness, Jesus was hungry. But Jesus didn't complain. Jesus was triumphant when He was tested and when He was tempted. Unlike the people of Israel, unlike ourselves, we are not, we are not equipped to handle the spiritual war that we're facing. 
We're not equipped for it. But Jesus is equipped for it. Jesus, when temptation came His way, He triumphed. He succeeded. See, when temptation comes our way, we're just like the people of Israel. We fail, and we fail, and we fail. But Jesus doesn't fail. Jesus is victorious over temptation. Not only is Jesus victorious over temptation, but because of the goodness of the gospel, His victory is placed upon your account. When you're in Christ, when God looks at you, He doesn't see, oh, you're failed, you failed, you failed, you failed, you failed. When He looks at you, He sees victory upon victory upon victory because when He looks at you, He sees Christ. And that is the goodness of the Gospel. Is that Jesus' account is put upon our account. His righteousness is is covering us before God. Now, Jesus was very successful when it came to temptation. So we're going to look at that real quick. We're going to look at what He did as far as when He was tempted. Because how Jesus responded to temptation, because He responded perfectly, we ourselves need to respond to temptation the way Jesus did. So let's look at the first temptation. The first temptation is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. It says, After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the first temptation was self-gratification. See, we are tempted to fulfill our wants and our needs apart from God's will. Too many times we take matters into our own hands. We look for instant gratification in this world. How many of y'all have ever been sitting in a drive through line and it's taken more than 30 seconds and you're like, what are these people doing? Yeah. So I'm not the only one, right? You're like, you get in the line, you see like three cars in front of you, you're like, ah, this must supposed to be fast. You know, whereas it wasn't that long ago, you're kind of like, ooh, I'd like some bread. Four days later, here's a loaf of bread. Now it's kind of like we can't get our hamburger in less than three minutes, and which should give you a clue, it takes longer to, to, you know, to cook a hamburger, so it's not the freshest that you're getting. But still, man, we want that instant gratification. And sometimes we run after that instant gratification, ignoring maybe what God has for us is so much better. God's will for our lives, for some reason or another, hardly ever enters into the equation. We're just thinking, this is what I want now, so this is what I'm going to get. See, Jesus was hungry at that moment. He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I feel like if I don't eat every four hours, I'm grouchy or going to die. Anybody ever had your kids say before, oh, I'm starving. Like you ate an hour ago, right? So 40 days have passed. Justifiably, he's a little bit hungry. See, Satan shows up and says, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. There's always a hidden agenda behind the temptations that face us. The enemy always has this hidden agenda. He challenged, If you are the Son of God. He challenged him. How many of you, especially men, if someone walks up and challenges you, can you be like, okay, and and back up? It's difficult, right? It's difficult to to show a little bit of self-control. 
you watch uh, football. We were watching the football game last night. A couple of guys started getting in a skirmish. He came, he's like, oh my gosh, it's so stupid. Why would they do that? I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Careful now. You know, you, you don't know what they said or how they, what they did. I mean, that could be, you know, part of me would be like, well, that's justified. I mean, how many, if you've ever played sports, there's always that kind of opportunity for skirmishes here or there, right? It has a little bit to do with our pride. But what you have going on here is you have this hidden agenda where he challenges, says, if you're the son of God, turn these stones to bread. Sounds like a weird kind of temptation, right? Because Jesus is God. I mean, he could just turn the stone to bread and eat. He's hungry. And if he turned the stone to bread and just ate, we would think nothing of it. But yeah, he's the son of God. He could do that. No big deal. And maybe not necessarily the act itself, it was the agenda behind the temptation. Hey, care more about your self-gratification than you, than you care about what God has for you in your life. That was the temptation. And see, Jesus responded with Scripture. And Jesus reminds us that we need to treasure every word that comes from God. Every word from God is valuable. So what I take from this is I need to learn to hang on every word that God has spoken to me through His Word, through the Scriptures. That determines how I respond to life. That determines how I approach people or approach situations. Not my own self-gratification in the moment. I need to rely upon God's Word. So that's the first temptation. Just, hey... Just do what feels good, natural, or right, according to your own eyes. Don't be fooled by instant gratification. Pray for God's will for your life. Then the next temptation we find in verses 5 through 7. So Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 through 7, it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Side note, the temple at that time was over 200, just over 200 feet tall. So you can think about the pinnacle of the temple would have been over 200 feet, so roughly 20 stories. A little bit taller than this. You know, you can imagine. So it wasn't like a little height. This is way up. He said in verse 6, And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will give His angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands, so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. The second temptation that we see here faced is self protection. We are tempted to question God's presence and manipulate God's promises. For what we deem is right and true. So Jesus is taken up, and again that challenge, if you are the Son of God. But then Satan does something different the second time that he didn't do the first time. Satan quotes Scripture to Jesus. He tempted him the first time. Jesus responded with Scripture. So Satan then tempts him and then uses Scripture to try to draw him out. He misuses Scripture. Too many times we try to take the promises of God or we try to take the Word of God and we try to manipulate it and shape it and form it to fit the life that we want and how we want it. We want to call the shots on our lives. Everybody struggles with that. I want things the way I want them. That's a natural tendency that we have because we're sinners. Sin is continuously pulling us away from God's will. So the idea of self-protection, you take care of yourself. You do things your way. And then Jesus responds... 
with the correct use of Scripture. So see, Jesus followed the Word in order to trust God, not test God. So what we need to do is I need to recognize that trusting God is far more valuable to my sanctification than I realize. It's easy to say we believe and that we're a Christian. It's another thing to put that into action. It's totally different. We can definitely talk a big game, right? That's easy. Sometimes it's harder to put that to action. So your life does not revolve around you. This universe, this world, this place, this church. You as an individual, we're all created for one purpose. To glorify God. Not us. You can't take matters into your own hands. You're here to live for God's glory. Then we see the third temptation. Verses 8-10. through 10. It says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Self-exaltation. We are tempted many times to assert ourselves in this world and rob God of His worship. In other words, we run to the world and we ignore God every chance we get. I remember uh, when I was working at Chick-fil-A many years ago and the owner came to me and he's like, hey, I'd like to give you a raise. I'd like to promote you and give you a raise. And I said, well, thank you. Can I take a day and pray about it and let you know tomorrow? And he was like, for money. And I'm like, look, I know I'm really trying to make sure that I pray about everything and don't just assume that's what God wants me to do. Now, I didn't say that when I was in college working at the golf course. And they said, hey, we want to give you a raise of money. Got it, take it, give it to me. But at this point, I had almost matured just a hair. And I was just like, let me take a day and let me pray about it and I'll let you know tomorrow. And I explained to him, I just I want to make sure this is what God wants me to do. See, it's easy to think about ourselves and to promote ourselves every chance we get. To make our lives better. I met this couple one time in Africa on a mission trip. They had a lot of things. He worked for Wall Street. Made a lot of money. They had two or three homes. They had a couple homes in America. They had a home in Brazil. They had these wonderful things of life. He got to about the age of retirement. Late 60s. And him and his wife in their late 60s, when they had their couple vacation homes, you know, had all these things, sold it all, moved to Africa, and lived in a block building with no air conditioning. Because God called them to go. From our perspective, that makes no sense. He had made good money. He had worked hard all his life. He got retirement. You get to enjoy all that you've, you've saved up in this world. But you know what they told us? They're enjoying the world and the life more than they ever had. Because they were doing exactly what God had called them to do. It's easy for us to look at this world and to think only about this world and try to draw as much from it as we possibly can. Jesus was tempted. He... Satan brought him out and said, I'll give you everything here if you worship me. Now here's the kicker. Jesus is going to return and it's all his anyway. 
Scripture says that He will come back. He will come down and ascend, descend onto the Mount of Olives. It will split open. He'll walk through the eastern gate and He will rule the world and all the nations of the world will be subject to Him here on earth. It was already going to happen. The timing is important. I'm going to give you a hint. You, if you're in Christ, will be far richer than you can ever begin to imagine. Think about it. New heavens and new earth is going to come down. We read that in the book of Revelation. And we get this new city, this new Jerusalem that comes down that has streets of gold and, and big gates and, and big walls. And, uh, and Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you and all these things. Gold is of so little value, we're just going to walk on it. You're going to have everything. No more pain, no more suffering, no more tears. It's all yours. Timing is important. Don't try to replicate what is to come here. You'll be thoroughly disappointed. Be patient. Glorify God where you're at and don't be consumed with all that this world has to offer. Be consumed with Christ and all He has to offer. And then all those things will be added to you when the time comes. But too many times we sell our souls and we, sell, we give in to this spiritual war for something now that is already promised to us later. We're like the prodigal son. Y'all remember that parable in Luke chapter 15? He says, hey, just give me my inheritance now. What's he do with it? Squanders it. You ever wonder why he hasn't, God hasn't given us the streets of gold yet? Maybe we would squander it just a little bit. But anyway, so here he is. He takes his inheritance. He lives large because he wanted it now. He wasn't ready for it yet. But he wanted it now. And it ruined him. Patience. Don't run after all that this world has to offer. It's a cheap version of what is to come. Anybody ever buy a dresser from Walmart? <laughs> okay, so you already know where I'm going with this, right? You buy it. If you buy it for your children, you got six months. And then it's gonna, you're going to walk in and it's going to be like, like this. And you're going to be like, what happened? And it's going to fall apart, right? Cheap, right? Instead of saving up, be like, we'll just live in baskets. We'll save up. And then we'll have someone like Josiah hand build us this elaborate, wonderful wood thing that will last. But we don't want to wait because Josiah's booked up and it's going to take him a year and a half to build it. And we're just like, I don't want to wait a year and a half. I'm going to go to Walmart for $35 and get it now. And then we're disappointed. If you try to live in this world and get all this world has to offer, you will be thoroughly disappointed no matter how much of it you get. So don't be pulled into this world where you're trying to draw all of your life and all of your meaning and all of your well-being from the things that are offered to you here. Live for Christ because all that you desire, all that you can imagine and more is going to be given to you for eternity in Christ. So don't waste this life living for this world. See, Jesus recognized and proclaimed to us that God alone is worthy of worship. I must be aware of who I am worshiping with my life. Because you can worship yourself. You can worship things. You can worship other people. But we're called to worship God. So ultimately, we see through these temptations that dealing with life requires all of our being. It requires our soul, body, and spirit to all be working together. 
So in order to fight temptation, you need the Holy Spirit working in and through your whole being. You need to give all of who you are to Jesus. I want us to close with two observations about the temptation. There's plenty more, but we're just going to look at two so that we can, you know, game start soon, right? So the first observation that we see here is Satan waited until Jesus was at his most vulnerable. Satan didn't come to him on day one of the fast. came to him on day 40. So see, the enemy is always looking for your weaknesses and your weakest moments. That's why you've got to be prepared. That's why Jesus was fasting and praying as He was led into the wilderness. He was preparing Himself for what was to come. Again, you can't wait until something happens to prepare for it. Any of you ever walk into class one day and they're like, oh, pop quiz. And you're like, ha ha, pop failure. <laughs> I had those moments more than I would want to admit, right? You got in and you're like, oh no, pop quiz. I got to study. Well, it's too late then, right? Should have been studying all this time, apparently like the teacher said. Right? You can't prepare for something as it happens, you prepare beforehand. Jesus was fasting and He was praying because He knew a moment was coming. You know that a moment is coming in your life where you will be tempted, where you will be tested, where the enemy will attack you. That's not a secret. It's going to happen. Are you waiting for it to happen? Or are you preparing for it? Second observation Jesus always responded with Scripture. Every time. See, Scripture is your greatest weapon in your spiritual war. But you can only use the Scripture you know. It's hard to use Scripture that you don't know. So you have to know the Scriptures. So how you can prepare for the temptation that is most certainly coming your way at your lowest and your weakest moment is that you're reading and memorizing and meditating upon Scripture daily. Allowing God to speak to your heart. That's how you prepare. That's how you get ready. Ultimately, we needed Jesus to come. We need the Gospel. We need to be saved. We need the Holy Spirit within us to help us, to guide us, to, to push us, to walk alongside us. Because we can see when it comes to these temptations that Jesus faced, He was victorious. We wouldn't have been. And we're not. I think we could all share stories of where we've fallen and where we've messed up. I found this quote from Tim Keller, a pastor in New York. He said, The gospel says you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe. But you are also more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope. Jesus coming to bring us the gospel is more valuable than our words could ever express. Ultimately, your eternity hinges upon your relationship with Jesus. He came. He was given the name Jesus because He will save His people from their sins. He was baptized to show that He was coming to die on your behalf and to be resurrected from the dead. He was tempted in the wilderness to show that He has overcome the tempter and the temptations. 
so that through Him, we too can have victory. So to face this world, to face temptations, you need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit walking with you alongside your entire being. Body, soul, and spirit. you got to be all in. If you want to face temptation in this world, if you want to glorify God with your life, you have to be all in. You can't be dipping your toe in. you got to get out of the boat and be all in. Let's pray. Father, as we come to You now and we reflect upon Your Word and just Your goodness and Your grace that You've given us in the Gospel. I just want to thank You that Your love is unconditional. That You give us hope. You give us peace. You give us love. And You give us an inheritance. And we admit too many times we fall for it. We fall into temptation. We get too focused on living in this world that we forget that we're living for a world to come. So we ask today, Lord, that You would just open our ears to hear from Your Word. Open our hearts to believe it. And then give us the courage to live it out. So that in everything we do and everything we say, we can bring glory and honor to Your name. And we pray for those who, who are with us today that may have never given their life to Christ, may have never been saved, may have never repented of their sins. Lord, we pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. So Spirit, we ask that You bring conviction upon those who don't know You, that they can't live another moment without You. And we pray for those of us who do believe. Spirit, again, that You would fall upon us in such a way that we can't live without You for even a moment. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.